This is the year you move. This is the year you take that next step. Whether you're starting out, starting over, or starting something new, you need a local moving company that you can trust. We're Mankato Movers. We're your hometown moving resource, and we'll get you there. Call or email about our pre-move service today. <laughs> I had my camera covered up with a piece of paper. Welcome, everybody, to our ICE podcast. ICE stands for Inspire, Collaborate, and Encourage, and is the brainchild of Tanya Deutscher, my wife, and I. This is a weekly podcast that we will typically host live, but also have the availability for replay on our ICE Facebook page, as well as on our ICE YouTube channel. Um, each week, we uh, interview somebody new who has an interesting story or um, is uh, uh, living life in, in relation to the three key words of inspire, collaborate, and encourage. During this most recent stay at home orders of the COVID-19 virus, both Tanya and I found comfort and knowledge in others. The podcasts we watched were from others in our industry or business coach style individuals, but also from general people that just had a positive outlook, not only on business, but life in general. We are excited to bring this to you each week at 4 p.m. Central on Thursdays. We will also have the ability in many of the presentations for you, the general public, to ask questions of our guests. So without further ado, let us get to our first ICE guest or to our ICE guest today. So our ICE guest today uh, is a name and face well known in the Mankato, Minnesota area. He's currently running his own insurance business, the Chris Willard Farmers Insurance Agency. He's a former sports commissioner of the Mankato area, father of two active sons, a radio personality, and survivor of a very rare, ex exceedingly rare heart condition. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Chris Willard. Hey, Chris. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, I, I discovered that if you put a piece of paper in front of your camera, it's hard for your camera to see you. So. Really? Uh, like that? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's gotcha. right. I will not do that. I won't do that either now now that I know that that's uh, what happens. Um, well, again, welcome. Thanks for being part of this today. Uh, I know you've you. had a full day like I have with uh, with our B&I group in the mornings on Thursdays, but uh, um, it, it was very nice of you to, to offer to be on today. So um, let's get started. Um, so, okay, so insurance is one of those industries where people do not really think about it until that, uh, oh, crap <laughs> moment in life. Yep. And uh, and, and just for the record, Microsoft Word did not like the word crap yesterday. It kept telling me that it might be offensive and that, <laughs> and that I should change it. I changed it to the normal one and it didn't like that one either. So we went back to, <laughs> so we went back to crap. All right. Yeah, we went back to crap. Uh, you can insure nearly anything and you can insure nearly anything in life. But what primary types of insurance do you offer at your agency? Um, obviously, well, you know, we're a farmer's agent uh, agency and everybody knows then that, uh, or typically does because they've seen our commercials um, with Professor Burke, that we obviously do home and auto. Those are the big things. Um, obviously, toys, meaning, you know, boats, ATVs, jet skis, all that kind of stuff. Um, we absolutely do life insurance. And then one of the big focuses with my agency is actually the commercial side of things. So business insurance, business owner policies. Um, commercial liability, commercial auto, um, uh, workers' comp. Um, that's another one, that, and that's actually one that uh, we're, is a real huge strength of ours um, is the workers' comp side of things. So um, I, I'm not going to say we can insure anything and everything because every insurance company has their their niches and stuff like that, and we definitely have those. But um, generally speaking there's a lot that we can and very little that we can't. So. Okay. What is a day like in your shoes that people can take inspiration away from working with you and your staff specifically? Um, every day is different. So, you know, just to say like, if I wanted to say what a day in my shoes was like, I mean, you know, get up, I come to the office, but once I get to the office, you never quite know what's going to happen. Um, you know, the thing with insurance is that so many people focus on the, the premiums and stuff like that. And, and don't get me wrong, premiums matter, but 
premiums don't matter if you're not covered properly. So when I'm working with clients, whether it's the personal side of things, their home and auto and stuff, or it's the, the business commercial side of things, my focus, you know, my, my first focus is let's make sure you're covered for those old crap kind of things. And let's make sure that if you do have that old crap moment, that it doesn't turn into another one because you find out, oh, you know, maybe I didn't have the coverage I should have had. Um, so I'm very focused on making sure that, you know, if, if a client of mine doesn't have a specific coverage, it's usually because they chose that. <laughs> and a lot of times it's, again, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. get into things like backup sewer and drain and suddenly they got water in their basement and go, yeah, well, we talked about that. And here's the form you signed where you said you didn't want that coverage because it was 200 bucks a year or whatever it was, you know. Right. So, right. I uh, think that that's probably the biggest thing with people it's not so much that they couldn't get insurance it's that they don't insure themselves enough. Yeah. To I mean, that's and, and on, the on the, uh, on the commercial side of it, that's especially true. I've had a number of people come into my office and there's one specifically, and, and I've known the guy for a while, but he literally sat back in his chair and said, I hate insurance agents. And I just, I was like, all right, tell me why you hate insurance agents. And he was telling me the story about a, what would have been a claim and he's like and they wouldn't cover it and i know you probably won't either and i literally kind of sat back and pulled up on my screen the quotes i'd worked for him and i went to a specific spot and i go right there that's the coverage you needed for that and he just kind of sat there like oh <laughs> so i said to him i was like you don't hate all insurance agents <laughs> you don't hate all insurance companies yeah. <laughs> You just we are not real happy with what happened there. I get. I bet he likes you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um. Well, not everybody knows this, but I I know this about you. I know you're a, a huge sports nut. Um, baseball, wrestling, I think, are probably your two primary. I'm not sure oh, yeah. which one's bigger than the other. I think it's baseball. But, uh, being the sports family that you are, I'm quite certain that if I asked your boys this question, they're going to say to you, uh. But tell me, whom in your life was was or is a big inspiration in your life, and why? Um, you know, the biggest inspirations in my in, in my life it, it it is my mom and my dad, um, absolutely. Um, but obviously, I, I will say, you know, on the sports side of things, uh, my dad's the one that got me involved in things at a young age. Um, my love affair with baseball is. It, it's with the game, but it's more the memories over the years and stuff like that. Um, most of them good. I mean, there was the time that my brother and I were playing hot box with my dad and I looked away and I looked back up and got a fastball from my dad right in the eye when I was about 10, you know. Um, and and on, on the business side, too, my dad was a very successful um, accountant. Um, and I know some people would be like, oh, accountant. Um, but he when there was a accounting firm here in town called Wolf Veteran Company. And it had various names throughout the years and everything. But for about the last five to 10 years of it being Wolf Vetter, he was the senior managing partner there. And then um, he led them into a merger with Ide Bailey and became the partner in charge for that office here. Um, so he had a very successful business career. Um, so, you know, on, on the sports and, and business side of it, it's, it's definitely my dad. Um, but I also can't even begin to find a way to ever thank my mom for all the things that she's done for me over the years. Um, it, it, it would, there's just not a way, you know, I, I interviewed uh, Carrie, uh, Carrie Sorensen. Yeah. And, um, I, uh, his is going to be taped in case we ever have somebody, uh, that, that bounces out and, and we need to gotcha. fill it. Uh, he, he made the statement that uh, mothers, especially mothers of all boys or mothers with boys, should should just get the uh, the automatic pass right into heaven because of what they, they probably put up with. And I, I, know, I couldn't agree more on that one. So, yeah, I, I will agree. You know, and, it, and it's and, and while I talk about my dad, as far as like, you know, on the sports and stuff over the years, um, my mom was almost always the one driving me to and from practices and stuff like that, you know, um, and she loves she loves sports as much as all of us do um we do we do tease her though because she's had four kids that played baseball or softball and and 
I'm hoping she'll actually hear this because she'll laugh, but um, it was only in the last few years that we got her to go away from using the term double out and realizing that it's double play. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, you um, sure that, uh, your dad taught you that the business, uh, this was your quote, the business world isn't just about business. It's actually about people. How yeah. have you used that lesson to encourage your own sons? Um, you know, here's the thing. When people think of business, they, they think literally, you know, and, and with insurance, they think about, again, premiums and deductibles and all these different things. But, you know, I look at it as what are we trying to really protect here? And that's what we're talking about there. And, and it's, you know, when I look at my agency and stuff like that, um, yeah, I know insurance and stuff like that, but you know, what's, what's allowing me to be successful is building relationships with people and getting to know people. And, and that's something that I've very much tried to, you know, pass along to my kids. And I, I think they're definitely getting it that, you know, sometimes there, there might even be something where you're like, geez, I don't really want to go to that, or I don't want to do that, but it'll help you build a relationship somewhere that the further you build that relationship, the better off you and that person are, or those you and those people are in the long run. So um, getting to know people, you know, and that's where even when clients come in, sometimes I'm asking them questions and the questions have literally nothing to do with what's on an insurance application or anything, you know, but it's one of those, I want to find out what, what do you, what do you really want to do? What are you really trying to do? And because sometimes, you know, the, the nuts and bolts on a piece of paper aren't telling the story, you know? So, yeah. And I, 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 you know, in my interaction with you that I've tried to learn and take away is, is, is that it's, you know, somebody comes into our store and they, they want to order some t-shirts. Okay. That's great. Um, but let's also find out what the, t Oh, the t-shirts are for a fundraiser for, you know, a uh, family member who has cancer and, and right. whatever. And, and so then you, you know, if you, I, I, for lack of a better term, you get more, more buy-in to that customer, I guess. I don't know, but it, it, it just definitely makes you feel like you're connecting. And and I know that some of our best customers um, that we have are customers that we've really forged deeply that, that personal relationship with them. I mean, we know, yeah. we know where they live, we know where their, who their kids are. We know, you know, kids is what the kids do for, for fun, yeah. you know, that kind of a deal. And, and, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, one of my pre-interview questions to you was what are some of the most important lessons you had learned in life? And I found your quote to, uh, to us, uh, um, to live by very encouraging. So I, I don't want to ruin the quote, so I'll let you share it with us if you would. please. So, you know, how I replied to that is, you know, life is short and obviously we'll get to some reasons why I, really feel that way later but uh the quote and it's one that i came across you know about five years ago when i had a little health scare and stuff and that quote was live life like a three one count um and for those of you that are baseball fans you might be able to easily figure out what that means but um you know for non-baseball fans basically you know if you're a batter and you're standing in the box a three one count means there's three balls and one strike in, you know, against you. And if the pitcher throws one more ball, you get to walk down to first base. Pitcher usually doesn't want to throw another ball. So a lot of times on a three, one count, you're going to see a fastball coming because the pitcher wants to make sure that he throws a strike. Um, and so the idea of, you know, live life, life like a three, one count is basically sit there and be looking for that fastball so you can knock it out of the park. And, and that's kind of what it is. And, I do have a shirt that has that on it. There's a store that I, that has gotten way too much of my money called baseballism. And uh, that's one of the shirts that I do have from, in fact, it's the first shirt I ever got from baseballism. So um, cool. I got it for Christmas that year in 2018. So I still have it. <laughs> well, and then uh, they must've been a quality uh, company then if it's still, still good five years later. So yeah, it, it actually really is a great shirt because <laughs> it's still nice and soft and still looks good. <laughs> Um, uh, just a quick speed round of questions. Uh, uh, proudest moments as, and, and I've got three of them here, proudest, proudest moments as a professional. 
Um, you know, proudest moments as a professional. Um, my agency with farmers is very new. Um, in fact, uh, I'm about a year and a half. Yeah, about a year and a half in uh, with farmers. And so on January 1st of 2019 was essentially my contract career date, the date that they considered my agency to be open. And for 2019, so earlier this spring, um, I was the District 54 new agent of the year. And um, essentially anybody that's three years or less um, is, is in the you know running for this award. And in my first year, I got that and I knocked off a couple of the like the guy who had gotten it the previous year. He was in his second year already when he had gotten it. And this would have been his third year. So in my first year, um, I was able to uh, overtake some some agents that are doing some pretty good things out there. And so I'm, I'm obviously pretty proud of that, being able to jump right in and just go. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Um, I don't even remember how I answered that one or if I really did. Um, you know, there's so many things that I'm proud of my kids for, both of them. Um, and some of it is, you know, some of it might be on a baseball field or a wrestling mat or a basketball court. Um, I'm incredibly proud of the fact that they're both phenomenal students and they get great grades and stuff like that. Um, I it, It's hard to really... I, Hell, I was proud the day they were born, <laughs> but I'm, I'm proud of the the people that they are becoming. You know, they're not just athletes. They're not just students. They're um, I think they're pretty good kids. Yeah. Good yeah. human being. Yeah. And proudest moment as an athlete. Proudest moment as an athlete myself or can I count coaching? Um, <clears throat> let's go. Let's go with the coaching aspect, I guess. Um, I had the opportunity. I mean, I, I coached wrestling for many years. Um, in fact, I don't know, 15 to 20 years I coached wrestling. And when I moved back to Mankato in the year 2000, um, my youngest brother was then only in like seventh grade. So I started coaching him and I had started coaching the Mankato club at the time. Um, my proudest moment was absolutely his senior year, um, sitting in his corner at the state high school wrestling tournament when he won a state title and got his arm raised and ran over. And I'm going to start choking up here actually talking about this. <laughs> but ran over and jumped onto me. And I've got a picture that it's one of those, like, it was taken on a digital camera in 2006. So you know the quality isn't great. But the, that picture, it's just, there was so much work that went into that over the years. And... And the year before in the state finals, he, he lost a heartbreaker right at the end. And so to, to get that and having been such a, it's one of those things like him and I, we still obviously like talk about it and stuff, but when we talk about that stuff, it's not, we're not talking about necessarily that state championship. We're talking about the steps along the way, the journey along the way. And the fact that I got to do that with my little brother was just amazing. Like I said, I'm starting to choke up. So next and question. I, 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 well, and I think that was yeah. just immensely cool for for your parents, probably too, to oh, yeah. uh, to be there and to be able to see the two sons out there on the mat and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. Awesome. It was uh, fun. before we get to the next question, uh, I got to learn something about you in March when you and I uh, collaborated. Yeah. We're going to call it collaborated about my health situation. You would. Uh, um, had obviously heard about what it was going on with me because we're in B and I together and yeah. you reached out to me and I would have never expected you to have this event, um, because you are such an athletic and active guy. And, um, and so share with us, uh, in a shortened version, I guess, yeah. um, the, your unique heart condition that you have. So to jump right to what it actually was, it was an ascending aortic aneurysm. Um, and so kind of the, the, the short version of the story is May 7th, 2015, I woke up, felt great, went for a run at lunch, was standing in my then office and talking with some coworkers. And suddenly I felt like I got shot right through the middle of the chest. And I, and it's one of those, you know, I've ever been shot. No, but I've, I've been punched and I've taken a baseball off the chest, you know, <laughs> and it was unlike anything I'd ever felt. And eventually, um, 
you know, the long version of the story actually is pretty funny, but eventually I made my way to the hospital and I remember, um, the doctor, you know, he was ruling out, it's not a heart attack. It's not this, it's not that he said the word aneurysm. And I just looked at him like, what? (laughs) And basically I said, now what? And he goes, well, Mayo one's on its way. We're flying into Rochester. And that was the moment where I just went, Oh crap. Um, so got to Rochester and everything. And it ended up being the first surgery was between six to seven hours. Um, the next one, they ended up doing another one because there were complications with bleeding and stuff like that. So another three hour surgery after that. Um, and I guess as far as what it was is, um, I've got a congenital heart defect, um, which is that instead of having an ascending or instead of having, uh, uh, now I'm going to blank the bicuspid and a tricuspid valve, I have two bicuspids. And so that created pressure and one out of a hundred is, or the numbers that I remember them telling me is one out of a hundred have that heart defect from there, one out of a hundred ever actually have an issue. And then from there, it's about one out of a hundred that actually survived that issue. So, you know, it's one of those, I'm incredibly fortunate to be here. I've got a big old zipper right up my scuff or, you know, right up my chest. Uh, and it's one of those, like every now and then, whether, you know, might be out on a lake or something like that. And somebody will be like, what is that? Because <laughs> like you, they really never expected it. And, you know, like I said, I woke up that morning and I felt great. Um, they had actually done the surgery the next day and I did not get to actually see my kids, um, you know, from the time that I went there. I was supposed to be at a baseball practice that night. My kids had no idea what was going on um, just because, you know, it was one of those don't tell them initially. And, but I'll never forget that phone call, um, when I was talking to my kids, which was, you know, through it all, I was very much like, you're going to fix me and I'm going to go home. And I was telling my kids that I'm going to be home, but there was a lot of doubt in there. And, and one of the things that I will share here from when we were, when I was in the hospital before the surgery was the, the surgeon kept asking, you know, do you have questions? Do you have questions? And initially I just said, no, how about you just bring and fix me and let me go home. Right. And, uh, you know, mom, dad, and everybody in the room had a ton of questions. And finally at the end of answering all theirs, he goes, are you sure you don't have any? And I go, all right, I got one. And he goes, what's that? And I go, how long till I'm throwing a baseball again? And my dad started laughing and everybody else in the room was kind of like, Oh my, you know, like almost disgusted that I was asking that. And then the surgeon himself just goes, Hey, that's a valid question. You know, you want to know when life is going to be back to normal. Right, 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 right. And uh, I, I would like to note that. So this was uh, May 7th of 2015. They told me that if I was lucky, I'd be throwing, <coughs> excuse me, a baseball by September. And it was like the first week of July, maybe the second week of July that I was throwing a baseball again. So I attacked that rehab. <laughs> And, and little before the year 2020, we were going to deal with a global pandemic that would make things pale in comparison to our personal issues, right? Right. <laughs> um, how has your life been different than what you would imagine when you were younger? You know, I promise I never grew up thinking I was going to be an insurance agent. <laughs> like, that's not, you know, when, when you're a kid, nobody dreams of that. <clears throat> Right. So that, that alone is different. Um, you know, people have asked me over the years, like, you know, do you have any regrets in life or things like that? Honestly, one of my biggest regrets was that out of high school, I went straight to college. I wasn't ready to go straight to college. And at one point I was going to go into the military. And honestly, I, I think like if I could go back in time and talk to 17, 18 year old Chris, I'd tell him, hey, go do that first. And then, you know, go the other route. Um, Because when I was 17 or 18, I honestly, I didn't know what I wanted to be. Um, And even when I got to college, initially it was, well, my dad's an accountant, so I'm going to be an accountant. Well, I got into accounting classes and I was like, I don't want to be an accountant. (laughs) You know, and I'm not even good with numbers. (laughs) I'm, I'm good with numbers. I'm really good with math and stuff like that. 
but it just, uh, it took me a while to figure out what I wanted to do. And eventually I ended up in the mortgage lending world for a while and that was great. But uh, then once I got to the insurance side of the world, I, I really loved it. Um, and, you know, you had mentioned earlier at one point, I, I took a kind of a hiatus from the, from the insurance world and was the sports commission director here in Mankato for about three years. And that was one of those things. I, I didn't leave insurance because I didn't like insurance. I left it because that job ended up getting offered to me. And I was like, I need to see, I need to take a chance on that and see, otherwise I was going to regret it. What I, what I did learn as the sports commissioner is yes, I love sports, but no, I really don't like politics. <laughs> so I ended up coming back to the insurance world. Um, how would you like your Wikipedia entry to, uh, I, I asked this one to everybody. Uh, how would you like your Wikipedia entry to describe you? Um, I would say a fun, good guy who enjoys helping out, who enjoyed helping others. Okay. Um, you know, when I think of things that I've done throughout the years, um, I coaching, you know, coaching is one of those things that I, I did it because I mean, yeah, I love the sport and stuff like that, but man, I love the, I, I love helping somebody achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, whether it's baseball, see, you know, baseball throughout the years. I mean, I, I was coaching all my kids teams, you know, when they were five years old, you know, when you're coaching a five-year-old team, you got some kids that show up the first day and they don't even know how to hold a baseball, you know, <laughs> getting, getting, yeah, you know, or they grab a bat and their hands are the wrong way, you know, and, and it's just, it's, it's fun to work with somebody and then see them, even if it's one time have success, you know, or on the wrestling side of it, there's there was a number of kids that I can think of. And I'll, I'm not going to name names or anything, but um, there's a number of them where you go, all right, you're not the most talented kid in the world, but you're working your butt off. And we kept working on something and suddenly, you know, might have been something little, but that's what helped them win that match or something, you know. And, you know, and it's one of those not – not everybody wins state titles, obviously, like like my brother did. He won a lot of matches throughout the years, but some of the better ones, you know, are those ones where it's like, man, that kid, you know, he had four wins throughout the year, but you know that what you did for them helped them even get those, get four of them, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Um, I had asked right, you if you collaborated in your life, and if so, how? And your response to me was, was golden. So please share that, and then I'll. I'll find um, that question better for you after that. Well, I know I had said that you'd probably need to better define it, but the, the fact is life itself is just a giant collaboration. Um, it, you know, if you're not collaborating with people, then you just, I don't want to say you're doing it wrong, but that's kind of how I would, I guess, feel. Um, you know, um, I'm divorced, you know, and there's plenty of divorced people out there that they do not get along with their exes or things like that. My ex-wife and I, we get along great and we collaborate constantly, obviously, as it relates to our kids and stuff like that. Um, you know, you're collaborating with family members on a lot of things and obviously on the business side of the world. Um, the more you collaborate, the more successful everybody is. Um, you know, even like... One of the examples that I've been using recently is, you know, we're in obviously our BNI group together. So, you know, who I'm talking about here, but we have another insurance agent in there who he focuses on slightly different, you know, stuff than I do. But some of our stuff really crosses over. And it's funny because in that BNI group, I've gotten more referral business from him, another insurance agent, than I have from anybody else in our BNI group. And so, you know, there's some people that come into our BNI group and they're like, you got two insurance agents. This is really weird. No, it's great. Here we are. We're competitor, competitors on some things, but we work together on other things and it works out great. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I was looking for when, when I asked the question. So you, you defined it with your own answer. That's it, it right. is sometimes it's not just about um, not <clears throat> about working with somebody because you have to, but because right. you want to, and it, it makes you both better uh, in the end run. 
Um, what we have found in, in our journey this past seven months is that you're not collaborating. If you're not collaborating with others personally and professionally, you risk getting left behind. And yeah. stuck uh, where your business is suffering, <clears throat> your friends are distancing. And as it turns out, the year of 2020, all of this was even more exacerbated by COVID. Um, you're right. right. Life is a giant collaboration. It's a machine that is sometimes well oiled and sometimes it needs filter changes. Right. What have you taught your boys about collaboration on and off the field or the mat? Um, you know, and that, that's hard for me to really answer because, you know, when we talk about things, you know, um, it's great if you're a really good player, but <clears throat> it's, it's better when you're on a really good team. It's a lot more fun when you're on a good team. And so sometimes it, it is, you know, um, making sure that everybody is working together because if everybody's working together, like I said, you know, winning is fun. You know, Let, let's face it. Winning is fun. And if you can help make others better around you, then, man, that makes it all that much better. And, and wrestling, even though it's, you know, everybody thinks of wrestling as an individual sport. It's not. It is so not. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> as a wrestler, you're only as good or how good you can be is very much impacted by who you have around you on your team, who you have to work out with on your team. You know, you could be, you know, have the most potential of anybody out there. But if you don't have good workout partners and stuff like that, you're your ceiling is capped, you know? Yeah. You gotta have your I mean, yeah. your foundation has to be your teammates, your, your yeah. coach, yeah. Um, and then obviously your own integrity and, and your own work ethic that, you know, in most cases, our parents are the ones that teach us that or our coaches. Right. You know, one of the, and I'm just going to, and this goes back to like when I was in high school, um, you know, the team that I wrestled for was not that great or anything, but one of my best friends, um, and we're still good friends to this day. Um, but my buddy TJ and I, we wrestled together from the time, you know, we were like, you know, eight years old or whatever. And, and I remember like, even outside of the practice room, we were best friends, like literally inseparable in the practice room. We wanted to kill each other. <laughs> and, and even like on days where coach would be like, all right, we're going to do these sprints or whatever. And you got to go to that line and then back and then that line and back and then the end and back. And as soon as it was like, we would start to challenge each other. So it was instead of going to the short line and then the next line and then the, you know, the furthest one, one of us all of a sudden on a given day would be the one to go, all right, we're going all the way to the end and back. Well, the other one would see that and be like, all right, now I got to do that because I can't let him one up me. Right, <laughs> you know, we pushed each other, and like I said, there was times, plenty of times, we made each other bleed, and we would walk out of the room. But as soon as we walked out of the room, we were back to good friends. In the room, we did not like each other, <laughs> but, <laughs> but just competitiveness and yeah, wanting yeah, to make yeah. each other better. And that's yeah, the inspiration sure. we're providing each other, and that's yeah. that's awesome. What does the future look like for a 60 year old Chris? Moore? Well, um, my hope is that at that point, my agency will be uh, obviously, well, my, my agency at that point will be, well, let's see, I'm 47 now. So it'll be, you know, 13, 14 years old at that point. Um, I'm hoping that, uh, I won't be retired. I'm not one of those that's ever going to want to retire early or anything like that. I'm hoping that, uh, or the plan is that I'll have put my agency into a good enough position where, where maybe I can be one of those where when I'm 65, I can be like, no, I'm not retired, but I only go into the office five days, you know, for five hours a day instead of nine, 10. <laughs> and, you know, if my kids ever, if one of them ever decides that, hey, maybe I want to get into the insurance business, um, it'd be a lot of fun to eventually turn this over to them. Um, that being said, if either one of them told me today that they want to be an insurance agent, I might kind of slap them or something and be like, don't, don't, no, not right. You're too young to decide something like that. You know, right now they're, they're, their dreams right now, of what they want to do should still be, I want to play Major League Baseball. You know, and and likewise, both of them have already, you know, 
kind of defined different things that they might want to do in baseball if they can't be baseball players. My older one has decided, you know, I want to go to school and I, I want to be the next Derek Falvey or Thad Levine, and I want to be the general manager of the Minnesota Twins. Awesome. And it's funny, my, my younger one, um, baseball related as well, but he's decided that, like, he said one day, he goes, I think my dream job would be the equipment manager for the Twins. And I go, and I said, well, why is that? And he goes, he goes, well, he goes, it'd be really cool that I, you know, obviously I'd get a lot of free stuff. And I'm like, okay, yeah, he's the younger one. But he's like, I would still, I'd be able to travel with the team. I'd be watching baseball with the team, you know. And, and as he started talking about it, we started going through it. He, he, like, further and further, he's like, yeah, I think that might be what I really want to do. And I was like, I have no idea how we get you into that, but we'll figure it out eventually. <laughs> Gotta, gotta find a way to get to the Boondocks first, maybe, and he gets yeah. uh, his resume a little bit. They're, they're regulars there, so they, you know, if if they uh, decided that they wanted to do something for the Moondogs, I don't think they'd have much trouble right now once they're old enough, I guess. <laughs> All right, uh, I got another rapid round of questions for you, and these are kind of fun. So here we go: rock or country? That that uh, it's both. Um, I'm, I'm all over the place musically. I'm sorry. Um, it, what was I listening to most recently? Country. Um, likewise, last night I had Metallica going loud. All so, right. Uh, well, then you kind of maybe ruined the answer for the second one. Elton John or Metallica? Oh, Metallica all day long. Okay. NCAA baseball champion or NCAA wrestling champion? <sighs> oh. Oh, um, I, I would probably have to go with wrestling on that because that's what I did more of. Um, likewise, and I, I actually, my my ex-wife was surprised when I said this recently. And I said, if, if our kids were ever good enough at both of these things, let's say they were being recruited by what, it doesn't matter what school it is, but the wrestling coach was recruiting them and the baseball coach was recruiting them. I would probably if all, say if all things were equal, go play baseball. Okay. Uh, so that would give me the, the college world series then. <laughs> Super Bowl or world series? World series. NASCAR or formula one? I know nothing about either. <laughs> uh, I know that farmers, at one time, at least, uh, had uh, somebody, one of the drivers with Kendrick Motorsports, we had a sponsorship with that. I don't know if they still do or not, to be honest. That's horrible that I don't know that. But um, so I th that would be more NASCAR, right? So then I got to yeah. go NASCAR. Yeah, yeah. Your, your, your district manager will be all over you on that one. Yeah. Um, golf or traditional or disc? Traditional. Traditional? Absolutely. Uh, does the hot dog eating contest belong on ESPN every year? Um, for one hour on the morning of the 4th of July, yes, it does. <laughs> it should never be on outside of that, though. So when they, if they start putting other food eating contests on ESPN, then I might struggle because they don't show enough wrestling. So, <laughs> Bo Jackson or Deion Sanders? It's Bo Jackson. He's the greatest athlete ever. And do you find that they play, do you find that the music they play and have uh, PA announcers during this year's Major League Baseball games annoying or comical? Um, it can be both. You hear, and here's the thing, like the other night, and I can't remember what game I was watching, but the, the, the noise was very loud. And all I thought to myself was, even when there are fans in the stands, it's not that loud in that stadium, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so it just kind of depends on which team and which stadium, I guess. <laughs> well, so clearly with that question, you can tell what I was probably doing while I was typing these questions. And that was, I was watching the twins and, and uh, they were, it was uh, the Milwaukee series and, and yeah. they're playing their music. I'm like, why the hell are they playing music? I mean, there's nobody there to listen to it. Right. The probably are in the dugout, either talking to themselves or got their earbuds in, anyways. And then I could hear the PA announcer. Oh, no, oh, no, up to bat. Right. Number I, 12. Uh, I, like, what is this? I kind of wish that, you know, they did, they had a real opportunity here. And what they could have done, and what I would have loved to have, is forget the background noise and all that kind of stuff. 
put mics on these players. I would love to hear, you know, especially you, you see it all the time where, you know, some guy gets a hit and he's standing on first in the first baseman and the guy on first are sitting there talking to each other. I would love to hear some of those conversations. Now, I guess yeah. they'd have to probably put a delay on it and, you know, <laughs> leave some stuff out. <laughs> right. But uh, I, I would love to be able to hear. And that's why, like, if I could somehow figure out a way to sneak into target field right now, I would be all over that because I know you'd get to hear some stuff that you never hear. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree with you on that. Um, let's see. We got a couple questions. Uh, or one, one question, one uh, comment. Uh, Carrie Sorensen says, what makes a good taco king? <laughs> So here, here's where that came about. So, um, you know, I'm a part-time uh, morning radio show guy, uh, Lisa Kay and crew on Minnesota 93, and I'm part of that crew. And so this morning we started talking about, you know, who can eat what. And Logan, uh, who's also on the show, started talking about the number of brats and stuff like that. And I just asked him, I said, in one sitting, what's the most number of tacos you've ever had from Taco John's? And he had said, he's like, well, I once ate a six pack and a pound. And I kind of, I kind of giggled and he goes, why is that so funny? And I said, well, in one sitting one time, I ate 13 of their hard shell tacos and a large potato ole. Now I didn't have the pound of potato olays, but 13 tacos. Uh, and so we started talking about some things food wise. So as far, here, here's the thing. There are some foods that I can eat a lot of, um, but I can also eat really fast and, um, I've, you know, there's not very many people that are going to eat, beat me in a Buffalo wing eating contest. Let's put it that way. But, uh, I think if you put me, I, I could go up against a lot of people on tacos. Now I'm not going to go against Joey Chestnut because that guy's a freak. <laughs> He's the hot dog King, obviously, but, um, I would say of the general population, I would crush the majority of the general population in a, a lot of food eating contests. <laughs> I, I've never, at least I don't remember being in any food eating contest. The, the only story from a food eating standpoint comes from my older brother, Bill. And, uh, and I know that he challenged my dad. Um, uh, there used to be a steakhouse over by Slayton, Minnesota called the Valhalla Steakhouse. Yeah, and they were famous for like their eighty some <clears throat> ounce prime rib or whatever, yep. and uh, and he challenged my dad that he could eat that, and I don't remember what the prize was, and uh, so my dad's like, okay, let's go, and uh, uh, he ordered it for Bill, and my brother got it down, but man, he was so not feeling well. I, I <laughs> actually, so I have a prime rib one story too. There was a resort that my family, we used to go to every summer for, I don't know, about seven or eight years in a row. And this is just like back when, well, my now 16 year old, he'd have been probably three when we started going or so. And anyway, they had their restaurant at the resort and they had a deal where, you know, if you ate this certain prime rib and I don't remember how big it was, but if you ate it all, you got a free t-shirt. So on, and we were there for a whole week. And I think it was, uh, yeah, on Tuesday night, um, I was like, all right, I'm going to try this. So I ate the prime rib. I ate the whole thing. I got a t-shirt Wednesday night. I was like, that prime rib was really good. I did it again. Thursday night. I did it. Both of my brothers did it. I got another t-shirt. They got t-shirts. We went back the next year and they no longer had that as a thing. <laughs> so I, I think um, our, you know, consecutive days of eating prime rib and taking all their t-shirts maybe made them think twice about this. I was like, oh, no, it's oh, make it bigger. T-shirts, that's the water boys coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Last question. You're 19 years old. You're headed to college. You get two sit down meetings. One with the likes of Kurt Angle and one with the likes of Nolan Ryan. Who do you feel would be more impactful in sports and in life walking away from either one of those meetings? Um, okay, here, here, and I, I need to clarify something. So Kurt Angle, the vast majority of people know Kurt Angle as the WWE guy. Mm -hmm. um, what they don't realize, or most of them don't, is that you know he was a 1996 gold medalist. He was an NCAA wrestling champion. Um, before he became the WWE guy, um, 
phenomenal wrestler, really intelligent guy and everything. Um, so in terms of answering that, it, it would be pretty interesting if I could have Kurt Angle, the, the 23, 24, 25 year old Olympic gold medalist, that would be different than Kurt Angle now. Um, but I, I think Nolan Ryan probably would still be the one that, um, that I would probably have been able to learn the most from about life. Um, likewise, 19 year old me was still playing, was still wrestling in college. So 19 year old me might've been like, no, I'm going with Kurt Angle because he could make me a better wrestler right now. And I'm not playing baseball anymore, but I, I think Nolan Ryan, um, you know, his mentality, and, and this is what I love about Nolan Ryan is his mentality as a pitcher was very similar to that of a wrestler going out on the mat, which was Nolan Ryan stood on the mound and said, that's my plate. <laughs> this is my field. And, and if you stood too close to the plate, you were going to be wearing the next pitch right between the shoulder blades, you know? Yeah. So I, I think he, he would have taught me a lot. I love watching the John Boy Media uh, clips on Facebook. I don't know if you ever see those. And sometimes he goes back and pulls up some, some great, incredible old clips of like old baseball brawls and stuff like that. And he just had one the other day that he pulled up and it was Nolan Ryan and I remember and, and uh, Nolan Ryan just beat the daylights up. It was, it was, yeah, it was Robin Ventura and he put him in a headlock and started hitting him with the uppercuts. And after that game, this is the part of the story that I love is that after the game, one of the, you know, media guys is interviewing him and says, what, you know, basically like, what were you thinking? Where did that come from? And he had said, he goes, when I was, and I don't know if it was his rookie year, or, but it was early in his career. Like the first time he had ever gotten charged on the mound was Dave Winfield. Well, Dave Winfield was like six, five, six, six, and you know, 270 pounds, you know? And he said, I learned then that if somebody came at me on the mound, it was swing first, ask questions later. <laughs> So, unfortunately for Robin Ventura, Nolan Ryan took out what he wanted to do to Dave Winfield on him. <laughs> well, and, and the reason I went that direction is, A, based on your age, I knew that you would know who Kurt was, but oh, yeah. Kurt actually has a Fairmont connection. Um, there's a guy down here by the name of uh, Jeff Belcom. Uh, oh, Paul yeah. Carlos Belk. And yeah. Jeff wrestled Kurt Angle in the NCAAs and did not, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I know that he didn't lose to him. So either they drew, they 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 wrestled to a draw, or Jeff beat him, and that's like that's, Jeff, uh, not a Jeff. Yeah. Jeff that must have been that that had to be because uh, Angle's junior and senior year, if I'm not mistaken, I think he won it his junior year and lost in the finals his senior year. But I know it wasn't to Belcom. so it, it must have been like Kurt's freshman or sophomore year that they would have met that if that happened. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's it's an awesome story to hear from Jeff. Yeah. Jeff Jeff's a good oh. storyteller too, so it's always a, it's always interesting to hear the story from him. Yeah. Uh, Kerry popped in here again and said he thinks it was Casey Kane who had uh, the farm. That, uh, that actually sounds right to me, but I still can't uh, say that for sure. So I will I will always bow down to Kerry Sorensen when it comes to redneck questions. He he, uh, <laughs> he grew up in that he's area. Got he's, yep, yeah, he's got him. So all right, well. Um, Again, thank you so much for sharing your story yeah. and your journey, uh, Chris, through sports and health and business and fatherhood. Um, I very much enjoy getting to know you both personally and uh, this past year and look forward to continuing to collaborate with you uh, in our professional lives. Um, so thanks for joining us. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. It's great getting to know you and uh, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Sounds good. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Um, next week on the show, we will have Stephen Piper, who is a youth pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Albert Lee, Minnesota. He's a huge sports fanatic, a loving husband and a father, and he's also an area football coach at multiple levels of the sport. So join us as we discuss family, faith, and sports. We would also like to thank our sponsors for today's episode. Gracie B. Doodle is a new up-and-coming online store and social media group for the decorated apparel design and sublimation sector. From digital papers to sublimation blanks and more, Gracie B. Doodle is a great resource for the crafters or the professional shops. Online at www.gracybdoodle.company.site. The Visual Identity Vault, located in the heart of historic Fairmont, downtown Fairmont, TVAV is a full-service decorated apparel provider with screen printing, 
embroidery, sublimation, and more. Also things offered are signs, banners, design services, paper printed products, promotional items, and custom gifts. 4,000 plus square feet of retail space with great deals for everyone young to old. TVAV also offers a variety of different fundraising opportunities for your groups needing to earn some extra cash for that special trip. Contact TVIV at sales at tvivmn.com or online at TVIV, www.tvivmn.com. The Wow Zone Family Entertainment Center located in Mankato, Minnesota has 24 state-of-the-art bowling lanes, a two-level laser tag arena, mini golf, video games, snack bar, sports bar, and full restaurant. Bring a few or bring them all, the Wow Zone can fit them all. And lastly, are you looking to either travel domestically or are you uh, internationally? Call Jana Hughes at Travelooza to book your next vacation. From weekends to resorts to cruises, Jana and her team are ready and waiting to get you back on your feet, headed for the sun and the sand. Call 1-888-869-0660. On behalf of both Tanya and myself, we'd like to thank you, the viewers who tuned in to check this ice thing out. And we hope that you found the message of inspiration, collaboration, and encouragement to be useful in your personal and in your professional lives each day. Thanks for joining us and have a great day.